welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session. Um, may I have a motion to go into closed session, please? So moved. Oh, that's right. As permitted, uh, as permitted by the section 3-305B of the general provision article of the annotated code of Maryland, I move that we go into closed session to, to discuss administrative items, interpersonal relationships, and to discuss collective bargaining, negotiations, or consider matters that relate to negotiations. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Um, I believe we'll be, what time will we be reconvening? 12.30. At 12.30, so thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, one o'clock. One o'clock. One o'clock will we be in closed session. Okay, one o'clock, we'll be back. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for the county citizens to review on QA, CTV7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. And during this meeting, we ask that you would turn off your cell phone and or pagers and have a whole personal conversations and comments outside of the meeting room. We will now be stand and be led by the Pledge of Allegiance by Jennifer George. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. Um, at this time, I need a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to approve the agenda as presented. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, the first item on the open session agenda is the individual action items. It is the teacher ESP support contract. Um, I make a motion to extend the teacher ESP support contract until October 20th. So moved. I have a motion and do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to extend the teacher ESP support contract until October 12th. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Next on the agenda, it would be the um, capital improvement plan. Do you need to use the, the yep, yes. okay. paper copies today, if that's okay with you? Thank you. Now I think we're okay, unless anybody has any I trouble. I think we're missing okay. one. Oh, Mr. Farley. There we go. Okay, so thank you very much for seeing us for this today. I understand you have a thank you. pretty busy schedule. So I appreciate that you're fitting us in. We briefly discussed during our last meeting the top priorities that we see for our state requests for fiscal year 2018 for our construction improvement projects. Today, we just wanted to go over in more depth what our top five priorities are and to let you know what we anticipate we're going to ask for from the state for these five projects. Our full submission for the CIP is due October 5th, and we had really hoped to share this with you for approval during the October 5th meeting. Um, since that one was pushed out, a week. The state is not really open to us delaying that any longer, so we're here today to see if we can discuss this with you. Um, what I've given you is a summarization of the most important pieces of this information, and we would ask for your concurrence on the top five priorities and what we'll be asking for from the state, and also our outlook through 2023, which is the summarization of projects on the very top that we discussed during the last meeting as well. So once we get into the packet, our first project that we are listing as priority number one is the funding for the addition to Graysonville Elementary School. We had discussed a little bit last time that when we went in last year, 
and requested our planning approval for the addition. The state didn't necessarily concur with our request. We had anticipated that we would have a uh, state rated capacity of 590 students and that the state would be contributing around a million dollars. The state came back with their response that they felt redistricting was probably a better option, utilizing the Centerville schools, and that they were only willing to kick in $617,000 for a state rated capacity of 536. We don't feel that that's ample. We feel that our growth is going to be above and beyond that before this is even built. And that if we're going to undertake this addition project, we need to be able to accommodate at least the 614 students that are in our seven year projection. So what you'll see in this request for funding, the second page is probably the most helpful. If you look at the bottom of the second page, what we are going to request from the state is the capacity for 614 students. With that number, our overall project budget would be almost 5.2 million. Of that, the state would be required to do 1.4 million. The rest would be handled by the county. Now, with that being said, the state actually mandates once we tell them that we are looking for 614 students they mandate how many square feet per student they will fund as we've started to go through our schematic process and now into design development for this addition we don't believe that we're going to need that much square footage to fulfill the entire program but this is what we are asking for from the state in hopes that maybe they will fund the entire request. That would be great because we would have more funds to do more to this addition. I think we're in a good position because we have been able to pair our needs in this addition down to a smaller square footage. So even if the state doesn't give us exactly what we're asking for, we should still be in a good position. As far as square footage? As far as square footage and as far as, as budget numbers. You said you pared it down. Is, there's a minimum requirement then, right? There's that a minimum requirement. Figures. What we pared down more than anything was the size of the addition to the kitchen and the, the surrounding areas, the office and the walk-in cooler size. It was um, thought last year that the size of the walk-ins was going to be a little bit bigger than what was anticipated this year. We're actually matching at this point what we've done for Churchill Elementary School, and that's been sufficient. Um, so that's what we're utilizing right now is our budgetary size for that. Um, so we were able to pare that down. We were also able to get back some square footage in our schematic design by not <laughs> including the cubby area in the classrooms. Instead, we're utilizing lockers in the corridors that the teachers felt was a good idea for the fifth grade population. Number one, there's less, less difficulty with hygiene issues when you have the lockers as opposed to the cubbies. Number two, the fifth grade population then um, starts to learn how to utilize the lockers before they get to mm -hmm. middle school. So it was a space saving idea, but they also felt that the students would get some benefit from that as well. So we've saved square footage. Yeah. Was the Churchill size that, that the kitchen area accommodated same as, as you're looking at on the addition? Yes. Okay. Yes. We met with um, Ruthann. Jim, I asked Jim O'Donnell to be here also. He's our maintenance foreman. Um, in case you have any technical questions, that Jim knows the schools inside and out. Um, we did meet with Ruthann Keho um, from Sodexo to discuss you know their productivity and how much they were using it up to churchill and a few others just to make sure we had the right size mm -hmm. in place so you know we weren't putting in something that was wasn't going to be utilized totally right um just a couple of other things that i want to <clears throat> note about the graysonville mm -hmm. elementary project i told you that we are going to ask for the state's reconsideration based on our numbers that continue to rise for enrollment. We think that we continue to show the need for a larger addition here. 
we're going to ask them to reconsider the numbers and the funding. Um, we're citing issues with transportation as probably our number one problem and our number one reason why we don't feel that redistricting is an option in this case. And we actually have some new numbers as of our September 15th enrollments. If you look at your second page, and this is the second page for Graysonville, you'll see that in the table at the top, the very lower right corner shows us the difference of students between Centerville, Kennard, Ken Island, Bayside, and Graysonville, and how many available spaces we should have between those schools. It's 171. This was from our projections that we did with the uh, Educational Facilities Master Plan that we talked about earlier this year. Since that time, and Mrs. Schultz was able to rework some of the numbers given the projections that she has as of September 15th, we are at a plus of only 30 students between these schools in our seven-year projection. So already, just from us looking at this in the spring and what we have now looked at as of September 15th, we have 30 available spots between those schools. So right there it says to me we have a really strong case to take to the state for more space in this school. The other part we were talking about earlier was, you know, transportation and transporting students to, say, Centerville schools. If you think about it, though, the um, Route 50 301 split, mm -hmm. that is the boundary of Centerville schools and Graysonville schools. So we would be transporting students that live right next to the school uh, all the way to Centerville Elementary School, which really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, and one, again, you would be changing the dynamics of the community, things like that. So those are all, you know, items that we were putting out there to the uh, IAC. So again, we will submit this document on October, October 5th. We'll be meeting with the state officials on October 18th and that will give us a much better sense of where they stand with our justifications. And at that point, we'd like to get on the agenda to talk to the commissioners and let them know what changes have happened since our last requests in the spring. <clears throat> I, I, yeah. We, I'm not sure how we'd work this, but we, what we could think about is getting support from our delegate, delegate. Because um, they have the impact to the state, and they have the understanding of the rural nature of our county, which is a big gap between Graysonville and Centerville is a lot rural. So you do then have to go next door to the school and send them to Centerville. So I mean, I think our a good point. we could get some support from our state delegates. They're Republican, and the governor is, and that. So I mean, it, it, stars are kind of aligned to maybe <laughs> get this point across. Just a suggestion. A good point. What we really do not want to have happen is, you know, it's all based upon population. And we don't want to have build something and then two years from now have six more portables okay. outside. I mean, and that's the hardest part of when you go to the state is convincing them that there is a need for it and there is a population growth there. So. Right. But yeah, I think getting the delegates involved this year especially may be important because we, we had mentioned to you before there are a lot of changes that have happened at the state level with the IAC. Their executive director resigned and there are, there are a lot of things happening at, at those levels. Uh, our architectural rep who has been with us on the Graysonville project was reassigned. So we will now be getting a new architectural rep. So if we have maybe some support from even higher levels, I think that'll be important. So we're happy to reach out. I think it's a great suggestion, yeah. uh, Captain Kelly. I'll reach out to them specifically, and we'll set up a time that we can, that can be like briefed on. Us. Absolutely. I mean, Ken Island High School is a great example of that. Yeah, pretty much almost a brand new school. Not that old. Do you need a motion for us to send it, or? Well, I want to show you the other four okay. top priorities really quickly, just in case you have any questions about those. And then we make a motion for the entire package to get together. Okay. Yep, if that would be okay with you. The second project that we are requesting funding for is Ken Island High School. 
This is the energy management system and fire alarm upgrades. This is partly life safety issue, partly just that these systems have seen their useful life and are in need of repair. Um, there's also enhanced technologies out there that make them communicate with other systems much better. So we will be requesting the funding to do both of these projects together since they're needed and there's just an economy of scale to be able to do this type of work all at once. We would propose that the construction for this happen next summer. So we would, or I'm sorry, um, we potentially would be looking at next summer, if not the following summer. Um, it all depends on what type of support we see and if we feel confident that the state is moving forward on, the state and the county moving forward on approval for this project. There's the potential that we could have the design done for next summer. If not, it would then happen the following summer. Correct me, but wasn't one of the pushes last year when we went to one of those meetings about upgrading the fire? Mm -hmm. They were the safety. The, yeah, the issues. commissioners were very much in favor of the life safety. No, but at the state level too, when we went to the yes, CIP meeting, you are correct. They had a big push about all the safety enhancements and the lighting and and yep. upgrades. So hopefully they'll and it's continued. Yes, yeah, safety, security, any of those issues. The third and the fourth projects are at Sedlersville Elementary School. The first one is the partial roof replacement. This is upgrading our low slope uh, single ply membrane roof areas. They're the flat roof areas that have seen their useful life as well. Uh, they're also part of the building envelope and we're hoping with this school to improve some of our energy efficiency, our security, um, and that ties into project number four which is the replacement of all of the exterior doors at that school for the same reasons. The last uh, project is Bayside Elementary School. When, wait a minute, when can the Southernville Elementary School project get done? Pardon me, when can that get done? Well, the funding, if we get approval from the IEC through the whole process, the funding will be available July 1st. This this is for the roof and not what we're doing out front. Okay, about right. All the other ones. This is for all of that the other doors. will be in November, correct, Mr. Pender? Okay. November 1. And then final project that we would be asking for funding for fiscal year 18 would be the Bayside Elementary Generator. Again, useful life necessary to upgrade uh, this mechanism. There are better technologies out there as well. And that's not slated until 2018? Correct. And again, if we see that there is ample support from the state, we won't have final approvals until March. Um, actually, I think the final approval happens in May. We'll have 90% in March, and then we won't know until May, until we have the final go-ahead. If we feel confident that we do, we can begin design in hopes that we could take care of some of this next summer during the break. Um, but we'll be able to evaluate that a little bit more thoroughly as we get into conversations with the state. And we're just sending up the first five projects, correct? We're sending up the first five projects. Let me show you, this is last year's CIP. I've given you the highlights. This is the document that we'll be sending, uh, or a like document of what we'll be sending. What is included other than these worksheets is all of the backup technical information. The state wants to see our roof warranty information. They want to see photographs. They want to see roof inspections. They want to see all of the backup documentation as to why they should support this project and support it in our list of priorities. So on October 5th, we'll be submitting a document that is this large. Um, but again, these are the main portions that I've shown you and all of the rest of it is just that backup. And we'll make that available to you as soon as it's compiled electronically. Okay. So you don't have to have the full paper copy. Okay. I guess at this time we need a motion to send the recommended first five projects of the CIP plan to the state. Is that correct? That and we would be looking at your concurrence on the summary page, just that we have the future projects in the lineup through 2023. They're what, trying to get... What's the limited renovation at Centerville Middle? That is still somewhat undetermined because we're dealing with... Uh, money, the state money that has been utilized for some other projects at Centerville Middle, 
um, and the state within a certain time period won't fund things twice. So at this point, it would be most of our uh, systems that we would be upgrading, but there's some potential for either maybe media center upgrades or something of that sort. It's still somewhat undetermined until I get a better feel from the state as to where they will be deducting funds for that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then if this, so should I do two motions, one to accept our priority list or just one to accept the CIP plan? One to accept the CIP okay. plan. Let's make a motion. I need a motion to accept the CIP plan and send up the first five um, priority projects to the state. So moved. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to um, ap approve the priority list and send the first five um, priorities to the state from the CIP plan for funding. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Thank, Thank you. you. Next on the agenda is the Churchill Elementary roof project. So I believe there were, there was a bid tabulation in your packet. Uh, should be a memo and then a bid tabulation that are in reference to Churchill Elementary School. We received bids for this partial roof replacement. Board docs. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, from board docs. So we received uh, six construction bids for this partial roof replacement. At the bid opening, um, or after the bid opening, it was determined that our lowest bidder, who was island contracting, was not compliant with the bid specifications, and their numbers were incorrect. I spoke with them. They indicated, no, we're sorry, we really did make a mistake and we can't do the project for that amount. And in speaking with Mrs. Landgraft, we are going to ask that they submit a formal letter to us stating that they're recusing, they're, they're rescinding their bid. Um, therefore, our recommendation would be to go with the second uh, lowest bidder. We've checked references, we have looked at their past performance and they are an acceptable company. The overall price of their bid was $276,000. This includes the acceptance of alternate number one, which was an energy efficient coating, and that was actually a $3,000 deduction to do that upgrade. And what is which their name? Beneficial. That is Rain Tree Services Incorporated. Because this is a state-funded project, this contract will also have to go through approval with the state, so we would ask for your approval today. We will be sending it on to the state for their concurrence, and then after they give us their approval, then we can enter into contract with Rain Tree Services. All right, so we need a motion to accept Rain Tree Services Incorporated in the amount of $276,000 for the Churchill Roof Project. So moved. A motion, do I have a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to accept the Rain Tree Services Incorporated for $276,000 for the Churchill Roof Project. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Second motion I need is to send the Churchill Elementary Roof Project to the state. All in favor, or um, I have a, mo so I have a motion. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to send the Churchill Elementary roof project to the state. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the presentations, which we start with the academic indicators, the AP data. So one of the things that we've asked uh, the curriculum instruction folks, and Mr. Brown is going to do a presentation uh, on our new academic <coughs> indicators. And one of the things, because of the time uh, restraint that we had today, this is just going to be an overview and awareness of what the indicators are. As you know that the park data is still embargo, that should be lifted. I think Mr. Brown's going to talk about that, should be lifted next week. So in October, 
what we want to be able to do is come and present on all of our academic indicators. Uh, one of the important things just to draw your attention to is that um, we've been able to narrow our indicators that we used to have. Uh, we had, I think, around 58 uh, academic indicators. We've narrowed that down to 15. And I'd like to thank Mr. Brown, Ms. Pauls, as well as the entire curriculum instruction staff and principals that have gone through this entire process. So, Mr. Brown, welcome. Thank you. As Ms. Pusey said, this is a, an effort by the entire curriculum and instruction team. Uh, I'm just fortunate enough to get my name on the front cover of the presentation. Uh, again, the purpose of the day is just to share with you the, the academic indicators that, that we've developed. Uh, and all our indicators have been developed with, with one outcome in mind, uh, that all students in Queen Anne's County Public Schools will meet or exceed the standards, graduate on time, career co in college, and civic ready uh, to be globally competitive. And we will also uh, limit or, or reduce or eliminate disparities among subgroups in the achievement gap. So starting on our benchmarks, uh, most of you are aware that we begin park testing in grade three. We wanted to have a achievement indicator representing grade two as well. So we looked at the grade two uh, in math and reading. We have a mathematics benchmark that will be given at the end of the year. And uh, again, as most of our benchmarks are looking towards the year 2021, by the end of 2021, uh, in both math and reading, 90% of our students in grade two will meet or exceed the expectations on that benchmark for that content. Can I ask a question, Mr. Brown? Yes. Who came up with the new outcome? All Queen Anne's County Public School students will meet or exceed standards and graduate on time, college, career, and civic ready to be globally competitive. I mean, it, um, is that our new, is that our that was a, a collaborative effort with all of our curriculum instruction staff as well no, as, I like our, it. I as just, our principals yeah. as well. You probably see Civic Ready, yeah, yeah. which is yeah, kind of new. And I'll give you a background on that. Um, Dr. Williamson and I in the spring uh, were invited to collaborate among superintendents and institutions of higher ed. And it was around this whole conversation around Civic Ready. What does that mean? And we were there with uh, our local um, with Dr. Veneer from the community college, and we ended up in this conversation around, so what, does, what would that mean for Queen Anne's County Public Schools to be civic ready? And this notion of shifting this global graduate that gives back to their community in a leadership capacity. So how can we tie this in, as well as student learning, student learning, uh, uh, not student learning, um, uh, the graduation requirement for, um, Service learning. Service learning. Thank service you, Ms. Pauls. Um, how could we tie service learning into civic readiness and leadership so that when students are graduating, they're giving back to their community around important issues? And one of the things that we had talked about with uh, students that actually came out of this was how could we use a project of bringing more awareness to the increase in heroin um, uh, throughout the United States as well. And these were ideas that were coming up from students, or uh, how could we deepen uh, a more of a conversation uh, around race and diversity given what's happening in the country? These are all ideas that came from students. So the notion of kind of tying all those things together has made us think what would it now an indicator look like? So what Mr. Brown will share with you, there's not an indicator in here yet that really gets to civic readiness. But that's the kind of notion that kind of came up in the background of the history as a result of it. Will we make this part of our mission statement? Should we revise our mission statement? I'm just asking if that's where we're headed. Sure, I think that's, uh, that, that's certainly part of, of the alignment process. The process of moving forward. And it does yeah. make you think about the civic part, and especially in today's political environment. What is the understanding of our civic, kids' civic responsibility and voting and- Yes. We bring that up in our That's right. I'm sure we do. We, 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 home, we starts in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, well, yeah. right. Yeah. But those all I haven't had a fourth grader in what, quite a while. So. <laughs> Especially the relate, race <laughs> relations. Right. Yes, ex it, it, exactly. And that's why we want to, as we start to think about this and recraft it, and what does Sorry, service I asked. learning. Just, no, it is, it, I'm glad we're having the conversation. Yeah. 
because we have to think about, one, how would we repackage it? But the bigger thing is, how would we measure it? So how would we know that kids are civic ready by the time that they graduate? So I think this is really a springboard to a much larger conversation with our business community, with our parents. How do we ensure that kids are giving back to their community? One of the strongest things that we have going for us in Queen Anne's County Public Schools is people want to come back. You know, we graduate students that want to come back and be teachers. They want to live here. Uh, and I think tying into this is, is an important aspect of who we are in, in Queen Anne's County Public Schools and, and the county at large. This grade two uh, benchmark, is this like a new test that we'll be implementing for second graders or is this an existing one that? Uh, the math test we have been giving for several years, the reading one is a revision of a test that we have used. Okay. It's just been revised towards more park oriented. So if I can just jump into that as well. Uh, if you remember from the Innovation Center, uh, one of team two is on early learning and school readiness. And with the kindergarten readiness assessment that is not necessarily mandatory anymore, we're gonna give uh, uh, portions of that to students. One of the conversations that we've been having as a team is back to this notion of closing the achievement gap by the end of grade two. And what we found is we didn't have a measure by the end of grade two to make sure that students were on track going into grade three. And because we didn't have it, now that we have it, we have no baseline data. So this is gonna be a baseline year. The assessment's being crafted, so in 16, 17, in the spring will be our first baseline data to be able to take a look at. But the early learning and school readiness group is really looking at the alignment of pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, grade one, and grade two, and the alignment of all of that. So that's gonna be, uh, and I also wanna to bring to our attention, just a reminder again, that students sitting in pre-kindergarten right now, when Mr. Brown was talking about the year 2021, which is right around the corner, our current pre-kindergarten students, they'll be in grade three. So this indicator is gonna help us really focus on that group of students in, in preparation for grade three, because that's when park starts. And you give a great reason why we need to have universal pre-K. I would never argue that. <laughs> <laughs> so the gap, um, I missed that, I forgot that, the gap, we're trying to, all these gaps, we want them closed by grade two. Well, going into, going into grade three, because what we know, it is, but what we know is that right now, 48%, almost half of our students that enter into kindergarten are behind. So what we want to be able to, to see and be able to take a look at is that historically, national research that says if that achievement gap begins in kindergarten more than likely they'll never catch up as they move through their educational experience so if we minimize that to the best of our ability we know that students have a much more greater trajectory as they go into elementary school into middle school into high school less likely to be an intervention i mean there's a lot of different pieces to look at after school programs summer programs summer reading loss um, but we believe collectively um, as a group that this is gonna help us in the long term, as a long term investment to close the achievement gap. Because as we get into our park data, we'll start to see some disparities among student groups, which as Mr. Brown indicated, when you go back to the outcome, if you look at the last sentence, achievement disparities among all groups of students will be eliminated. And I think this is in an, in an effort to align to that. I apologize. Uh, then we move on to grade three for the park assessments. And again, English language arts reading as well as math have a very similar indicators. Uh, by the end of the 2021 school year, 75% of our students in each grade level from grades three through eight will be designated as on track for meeting college and career readiness. And that's using the performance uh, level indicators of four or five uh, on the park assessments. And again, we will look at each grade level uh, in both content areas and, and see where we're meeting uh, that percentage and we'll also be looking at our subgroups and making sure that we're not losing any students that way. And I just want to add to that uh, very similar when we've gone through this redoing our metrics we've gone back historically because it, it gets into the question of how much is is an adequate amount of growth over time and we've looked historically 
uh, when we go back to HSA, those numbers are relatively about how much growth we would expect over when we get to 2021 as a series of. And when we share the data with you, what we'll share with you is here's where we are and here's what we anticipate to be by 2021 and what are those percentage of benchmarks along the way that we would anticipate to get to. Our, our next set of indicators, uh, again, goes towards PARC, uh, Algebra 1, and English 10, which are our graduation requirement uh, uh, courses and tests for PARC. Uh, by the end of 2021 school year, 80% of first-time PARC Algebra 1 test takers, or English 10 test takers, uh, will be designated as on track for meeting college and career readiness and then scoring a performance level of four or five on the assessment. And we're doing something for those students. We're, we have like the bridge to excellence as far as the students who can't take algebra one and pass it. The bridge plan. The, the bridge plan. The, yeah. Yeah, we are just still doing the bridge plan. Yes, it's it's Sorry, it used to be called the bridge of excellence. I'm dating myself. Well, the, that's the, the bridge to excellence yeah. as, as it relates yeah. to the strategic yeah. plan rather than the bridge plan for academic validation is okay. what you're referring what to, called? which is tied into okay. the alternative pathway towards graduation. Yes. The on track. Okay. I mean, you could say 100% on track. Well, on track as being measured by a four or a five. We, we can't say that they are going to graduate. If, if they're if, four, they're on track. They're on if track, they're yes. If they're three, they're not on track. They're three, they're not on track. Okay, all right, I see. All right, got it. They're close. Right, right. Yes. But they could be in the upper track. level of that continuum. And again, we are still looking at level four and five only at this point. Uh, the graduation requirement is still up in the air from MSDE as to whether that will be a level three but for our indicators, we are targeting levels four and five. Uh, the government HSA, uh, by the end of 2021, 95% of first time test takers will score proficient in the government HSA. That is a lofty goal. Uh, That's however, funny. the government HSA has been one of our best HSAs. Uh, yeah, is proficient a three to a five? Well, it, HSA does not have that. It is just a basic a proficiency. Or proficient. Okay. Uh, and it's the, the old HSA still. Okay. Uh, and we were almost 90% two years ago. So to go much lower than that, we, we didn't think we would be challenging ourselves. So we, we wrote a very challenging indicator there at 95%. World languages, by the end of 2021, 60% of our seniors will have completed three or more credits in the same world language. So if they take a percent. Spanish one, it's one credit, Spanish two is one Correct. credit? Okay. Yes. yes, and they need two credits in order to meet the college completer, the Maryland college completer, um, in order to graduate. Um, so, as and this kind of goes back to the beginning of the outcome, when we talk about global competitiveness, this is in alignment with ensuring that students have, you know, not only more access, but the opportunity to take more language. I mean, it's many colleges and universities now are requiring students in some engineering programs to have four years of a language going into uh, an engineering program or into college. So, this certainly is in alignment. Um, with our notion of being globally competitive, speaking, you know, ideally for a student to graduate um, bilingual uh, is, I, I think, a, a notion that we really need to shoot for. Our, you know, our world is changing. Uh, they're going to be exposed to more uh, diverse cultures, uh, which is fascinating about this generation more than any other that has more friends, millennials, that, that, are, that are diverse. I think this is a, that's a wonderful thing. We have a large percentage that, that have two or more credits in the same language. We have a smaller percentage that have three credits, but not in the same language. And this is actually shooting for three credits within the same language. Uh, PSAT participation, uh, we are shooting for 95% of our students in grade 10 and 11 will have participated in the PSAT. Uh, 
and then moving into college and career readiness indicators. Uh, and the, next, the two on this page are very much related. And by the end of 2021 school year, 75% of high school juniors will be designated as college and career ready in English and math by the end of their junior year as measured by the Park CCR assessments, SAT, ACT, IB, AP exams, or ACCUPLACER. Can you remind us what IB is? Uh, International Baccalaureate. Correct. It's a program similar to AP in, in a way. It's a it's, course It's, it's accepted uh, globally, uh, internationally. Uh, it's, a, it's an academic program. There's actually a middle years program, there's a, uh, a primary years program, a middle school program, and then a, a high school program as well. But they would receive similar, uh, they would receive the IB diploma if they score at a, at a level that's recognized anywhere around the world, any university around the world. It's very prestigious. And by the end of 2021 20, school year, 90% of our high school seniors will graduate college and career ready as measured by the Park CCR assessments, SAT, ACT, IB, AP exams, ACCUPLACER, dual enrollment or industry uh, certification tests. So that really ties in the uh, career ready aspect of it by the end of 12th grade. AP honors and coursework, or AP honors coursework, uh, by the end of 2021, school year 75% of all seniors will have completed at least one AP honors or dual enrollment course. So they will be getting, uh, you know, participating in a rigorous program. I, I understand yes. though that if they haven't started in that process, then, you know, at eighth or ninth grade, then they're not going to an AP class. So how can we, we have 75% of the, students in like eighth and ninth grade now are in AP classes? Well, it, it's by the time they're, they've completed their senior year, they will have taken an AP course. A lot of them are on advanced or honors courses now. Uh, I know, but not all of them. I, mean, I don't think a vast majority of them are. And, and, and that's what we want to be able to look at. I mean, to your point, you're exactly right. You ha when To build advanced placement programs, you really have to look at early learning and school readiness, right? So if we change that dynamic there, that puts them on a different trajectory. Um, a lot of times in advanced placement in mathematics specifically, because mathematics is so unique about having at a certain level of mathematics by the time you get into eighth grade, will determine somewhat of your pathway when you get into high school. We almost start running out of courses. But on the other side of that, uh, one of the best AP courses to take for first time AP test takers is AP Human Geography. Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, sometimes you'll see ninth graders take that, sometimes you'll see 10th graders take that. Um, that is a first good introductory. So one of the things on the back side of this is when we start monitoring these indicators and start looking at strategies to ensure proper course taking patterns for kids. So. Uh, but we believe that um, more of our students should be able to score um, at that particular level by the time you know they they graduate. I think is a, is is realistic. Well, break, breaking down the numbers, if we have 1,200 students at our high school, I mean 75 percent is eight to 900 students. That's not unheard of to have each one of them take, take at least one honors class. Oh, is that right? I didn't know. It's, yeah, it's I mean, combined. It's just a, and, and in eighth grade, if they haven't started by seventh grade, no, they're no, not no. on the track to get Algebra one. But I mean, looking at the numbers, 800 to 900 students taking at least one honors, it, I mean, you're meeting your, your indicator. And that's what's new. We've added in the honors courses. So if we believe that our honors courses, we never had honors as part of that. And, and Mr. Brown is exactly right. This is around a rigorous course path taking sequence. So we added, now that we, when we looked at our numbers, when we added honors to that, we saw over the last, and we'll show that to you when we break down the data, we've seen over the last five or six years where we've seen an increase in the number of students taking honors courses. Um, now, the back side of this is that our current honors courses are not weighted. As in many jurisdictions, they are weighted. And that's something that the high school committee should, should be taking a look at, um, that if they're as rigorous as they are, they'll get a different quality point, which adds into their graduation, which 
is a whole different conversation. Thank you for bringing that up. Also, Chess um, Chesapeake College is hosting some of their classes at Ken Island High School this year. Oh, so those great. students have opportunities to um, be involved in dual enrollment, enrollment classes right there at the high school. And we had space? Great. We had space at the we high school? We had space to accommodate them. We had a class in the fall, and we'll have another one in the spring. Can so. we also get that at Queen Anne? Um, we're working. <laughs> that would be like, I mean, that would be great. Great opportunity for children. I think we had um, nine students enrolled this year, so we're looking to increase it. Thank you. And, and just looking at the numbers, and don't think of the whole high school either. Think of your senior class, which you're talking about 600 students really in the senior class. So 75% would be about 450 students that would be looking at current seniors right now that should have at some point taken at least one honors course or an AP course or a dual enrollment course. So it's, it's we're not real far below that level right now. I don't think it's going to be challenging us too much to make that 75% if we put some good effort into encouraging the kids to start early on at looking at those honors courses. Well, especially if you wait, start waiving the honors, they'll be more inclined to want to do it. <laughs> the encouragement. He wants to work more and get nothing for it. Right? Right. But we'll have to make sure that how we designate which courses are honors through a, through a process. Because sure, sure. most students will say, well, I'm not taking it unless it's honors. Because <laughs> it will naturally tie into their um, GPA. Their GPA. Right. Sure. And related to that, by the end of 2021, the school year, 40% of all seniors will have earned a minimum of a score of a three on at least one AP exam or earned a college credit while in high school. So we're looking at that dual enrollment piece credit. or the success in AP courses. And of course, in all these, we're still looking at our subgroup data. And we want to make sure that, that we are not eliminating any students from AP courses, dual enrollment, honors courses, uh, just because they, they are in a subgroup. Uh, additional academic indicators that, that will be coming up. Uh, this year we have a brand new science test in fifth and eighth grade is replacing the MSA science which is going away. Uh, this is now the MISA, the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment. It comes online this year for the first time. We did not think it was prudent to write an academic indicator on it when we haven't seen the test yet, but we will be doing something with elementary and middle school science. And this is also the last year for the biology HSA. <coughs> So again, we did not write an academic indicator addressing the biology HSA since it will be replaced by a high school uh, MISA test, which is field testing next year. And so we will be at least two years out before we have any real data on that. Mr. Brown, is that only, only after they take biology one, they would take the biology? When they complete the biology one course or the, the comprehensive biology course, they would take the biology comprehensive HSA. Comprehensive biology, okay. Uh, bi the MISA test. Uh, actually, no, that is wrong with MISA. MISA is actually a combined science test. So it, it is actually biology and chemistry. So they'll take it at any time? Or are they doing this only in 10th grade? What are we doing? It, it's going to depend on the course taking pattern and how those courses are created. And that's what uh, Mr. Page is in the process of uh, of creating that. So when we get to this indicator, we'll provide you, because that, that's, this is a really good time to provide you with an update on how the curriculum is changing, right. how the professional development is changing. As I said, this test is still two years out before we will look at any kind of results. It will be field tested next year. This year we're still doing the old biology HSA at the end of the biology course. Next year we will integrate the, the MISA test and we will need to see where it falls in a student's science course path. That's what I'm saying. And you don't, not necessarily a 10th grader, but it could be a, a junior or a senior Correct. taking biology. And then they would take the They, they would take it when they completed okay. the course requirements for the test. OK. Uh, As always, great things are happening in Queen Anne's <laughs> County Public Schools. Uh, those are the academic indicators, all for goal one, which is with, uh, we are still working on other indicators that, that relate to safety in, in schools and, and other areas. And I believe 
someone else will be presenting on those at a future meeting. Yes, that's what we want to be able to do is we're going to keep bringing back what our indicators are, how we're measuring our success. And just to kind of make a couple connections to this is, one, now that you have this overview, then we're going to start bringing you um, our current data that we have for that and what our projections are of moving forward. This ties directly into the Innovation Center. This ties directly into the curriculum management audit of the work of moving these indicators forward that directly tie will make that connection. The last thing I want to say to this is then when we show the data uh, going forward in next month and in outlier years, what we're also going to share with you is our professional development as a school system has to be directly tied to student achievement data. So what you're going to see in the future is this is what it says, this is what the knowledge and skills where we're seeing gaps and then here's what we're going to do about it from a professional development standpoint. And more importantly, how are we evaluating the effectiveness of our professional learning? And we'll use that in a, repet in a repetitive improvement process cycle. So I just wanted to kind of tie a couple of those pieces together. Uh, Ms. Pauls, Mr. Brown, thank you very much for sharing this information. Are there any other, are there any other questions? Professional learning of who? Students, the teachers? Who? Teachers? Yes, it would be teachers. Uh, so one of the first things that our curriculum instruction staff, they're already doing it, is once you, you take a look at the data, is then to start drilling it down and looking at where are the knowledge and skills, what do kids need to know and be able to do? So what academic standards are we finding that students are not being as successful with? And then what they're doing is tying that information back to what teachers are using to instruct. So are there gaps in the curriculum that we need to tighten up that supports teachers in an indicator that maybe we're finding that students are not being successful with? So in that process is now unpacking now the teacher knowledge and skills. So you go from student knowledge and skills to teacher knowledge and skills. And then the third piece is leadership knowledge and skills. So all those three pieces tie together. The teacher has the direct impact, the teacher has a direct impact on the student, and the leader has the most direct impact on the teacher. So we want to align those three pieces and support principals and supporting teachers with improving practice. So, in the, so then in the knowledge and skills part also are the tools. Because yes. if we're using the wrong tools, yeah, strategies we're not exactly. The results we exactly. Want. We had talked about that earlier. Yes, that's <laughs> okay. Thank you for bringing that up. That's the how. The intervention. Whatever. Yeah, that's the how. And if you remember Dr. Thunberg way when he talked okay. about the the triangle about the great equalizer of curriculum to improve instructional practice, especially among the social economic factor, is there's the work plan. That's the curriculum. Then there's the work, which is the delivery. That's how teachers go about doing it. And then the last piece, which is the assessment, is how do we know? Right. And you're exactly right. That becomes what we're putting in the hands of teachers, the materials, the instructional strategies, so they can make those on-the-fly decisions that a strategy for you might be not the same strategy you'd use with another student. Okay. Excellent point. Any other questions? Okay. Next on the agenda is the calendar committee update. Mr. Farley. We're uh, making good progress in, in uh, drafting um, a first draft of a calendar based on the uh, new mandate to start after Labor Day and finish before June 15th. Uh, Mr. Brown has been helping us. He developed a, a template last year. You want to talk a little bit about what, what's the magic in the template? Uh, the, the template is just a very simple spreadsheet that as you block out days that are non-school days, it just puts, pushes the count further on down the line so we know directly when the school year ends. It also keeps tallies of how many professional days are in the calendar uh, and marks those off to make sure we have our magic number of 185 school days for students so we can subtract out the five snow days and then the number of professional days for teachers in there, so keep putting in the statutory contract. days. The and the, the statutory days that were required by COMAR uh, to be out of the, the schools. After all of those uh, sort of mandatory pieces are plugged in, how much, how much flexibility do we really have, you think? Uh, when we put, before we put professional days into the calendar, starting after Labor Day, and just taking off the days required by law, I 
think we came up with five additional days before we hit uh, June 15th. Correct. It may have been six days in there, but I'm pretty sure it was uh, five or six days. By the time we put the professional days within the school year where they fall, we pretty much can end by June 15th. Uh, we just do not get that Wednesday before Thanksgiving off. We are limited to the, the, the law on Christmas, which is Eastern. the 25th through January 1st, uh, Labor Day, Memorial Day, Martin Luther King's birthday, and President's Day as the legal holidays. And then we did put in there clothes for the convention day at Ocean City because that seems to be an issue. And you're left with Friday, Monday, Easter, that's it. And yes. Captain Kelly is also a member of that committee, right. that calendar committee. I just want to bring up to the calendar committee, let you know, this um, we went to a meeting at May on legislation, and they have gone, I mentioned it to you earlier, they have gone forward with, um, the lawyers got together and said they think that it's illegal for the governor to have an executive order saying you're limited to that amount of time. So it might behoove us, because this could just go away to make a calendar to happen to be set before Labor Day also, have one of those made. And I think we were talking about that already, in case it fell through. The well, I think that we were also going to get community feedback. Yeah, that's the goal as we have in the past, and I believe you were one of the advocates for that, Captain Kelly, is that um, once we have some drafts that are ready f uh, to solicit feedback, uh, we would get them out on the web with the help of uh, Ms. Harrison and, uh, and then it sort of aggregate that down into themes so we can have better discussion. But our hope is to have this um, pretty well ready for everyone to move it forward, I would imagine, by December. Were, were we m making one up for before Labor Day also? Um, well, well, we sort of have that one <laughs> already. <laughs> We, we, I, I haven't officially done that with the minimum number of days in there. If, if so directed, I can put one of those together as well. If, if Geneva can. Well, that may be one look thing, thing that the public would might have, might want. I mean, they might want to say I've heard a lot of impact from input from people saying they like it to start after Labor Day. So yes, this, this is a good year. Once they see what that looks like, yeah, this is a. This good is year. a good year for starting after Labor Day because it's an early Labor Day and where Christmas oh, yeah. falls. Christmas falls on Monday, so it's not like we're going to be going to school on Christmas Eve. Uh, so this is a good year to do an after Labor Day start. I think the governor picked a perfect year to do it. Uh, if we had kids sitting in school Christmas Eve, the, the parents might not be quite as willing to do the, the post Labor Day start. But like it will be next year. <laughs> well, we just have to deal with it. And, and, and which year when it falls of, that way, yeah. but sooner or later it will hit us. And I believe, speaking of which, calendar committee is going, when they present to us in uh, November, December, we'll present two-year-out calendars. So not only 17 and 18, but 18 and 19 as well to try to, because I know a lot of parents really want to plan for that following year. And if we have to make an adjustment along the way, it might be a, a good practice to try to approve two calendars out and if we have to make an adjustment. So I know they're looking at that as well. To your point, Mr. Brown. Yeah, yeah, and, and actually we have that calendar put together, a post-Labor Day start already put together with the bare minimum holidays in it. But what we need to find out is what is the bare minimum that, that parents want to see their kids in school be, or out for holidays so that we know whether that Wednesday before Thanksgiving is critical to people and the Tuesday and Thursday around Easter is critical. And we still, we're, we're still seeking more information on the waiver, what that actually means, the days that you can waive either before a Labor Day start, after a Labor Day start, snow days. So that has not been yet communicated um, with our local jurisdiction. So there's still more to learn um, as, as we look at the governor's um, executive order. We had talked about this before. We really have to find out when all the testing dates are because that pretty much drives our calendar as far as the, the student we've actually, days. We've actually, um, with the help of Mr. Brown, um, created an opportunity to layer the calendar so that you can say, I want to see the testing dates and the holidays. Mm -hmm. So you can configure it in a way that helps you most to maximize the, the year. Because one of the things that the teachers and the parents all said that the parent-teacher conferences fell 
off from when the uh, report cards came out. And, and if we could align those a little better, I mean, I think that was a bit an effort. That was, to a, do that was that. a big deal, and I, and I agree Last with year. that. We need to align that. And, and starting after Labor Day, we, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm dating myself, but we did it the whole time I was growing up, and we made out <laughs> fine. And waivers, they need to be used for snow days. Honestly, we had a heck of a time adding days last year, and and uh, I would I would really recommend keeping those waivers open for snow days mm -hmm. rather than I waste agree. them on trying to go before Labor Day. Uh, just a recommendation. I, well, I, yeah, but every student, every county is looking at, including Maeve, of what they can put in for a waiver. Yes. So it, I mean, I think it's kind of a separate issue. The snow in the way so allowing snow so days waivers waivers and, yeah, and they're allowing separate that's separate pre, everyone's pre gonna, because okay. they're all kind of getting together with them um, what do we want to do as a group of 24 counties and how many of us want to ask for waivers and is that enough to have Maeve go forward and say we need waivers waiver on this so that they want it but what we need to do is they're creating what I was telling her like a blog they're gonna have on the Maeve website that says when you come up with an idea of an unintended consequence for limiting us from Labor Day to June 15th. One of them, then, then list it so that we can all get some ideas on what would be waiverable items. One of them mentioned something, and I, I'm unclear of it, but something to do with kindergarten, kindergarten uh, assessment. They come in after Labor Day, they don't have much assessment. data to you look lose at. lose a week of kindergarten assessment. Yeah, to assess, and when are you assessing? You know, I mean, it's, and that's the kind of things they say that sure. they're finding are problems with this that no one thought about. It shortens the, the, the calendar year for, for AP testing as well, so students are taking right, the AP test much earlier. That you know, there, there are advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. of it. And like I said, AP testing happens no matter what. Yeah, right, it's going to happen that first week of May, no matter what. Yeah. Now the other counties, a lot of them are not on our system, though. They're on a, they're on a quarterly system. Or they're on the, the full, full, full year. Full day. Full year. Yeah. So, that might be, and I mentioned to you that might be something we might want to rethink. If I mean, I don't know the benefits. Or I don't know anything about it, but I just know that Queen Anne's sure. County is on a different kind of system than say Anne Arundel County is, and that it's is definitely ongoing. People cool. have yeah. had uh, problems with that over the years. Mm -hmm. Some the teachers I know in Anne Arundel have complained that maybe live over here, that their system works better than ours. So that's something to look at. And the curriculum instruction talked about the block schedule. We did. Okay. Just okay. Just just high right. school okay. Got it. Oh, thank it you. is on the agenda. Perfect timing. Thank you. Thank you. Talked to Mr. Kaluski today about having that um, discussed on our with our innovate innovation center. So it's in the works. The block schedule. Okay. The Great. block schedule. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, next is just the upcoming meetings and events. We have Unity Day, October fifth, the MABE annual conference, October fifth through seventh, and the teacher. Maryland Teacher of the Year Gala, October 7th at Martins West. Can I, um, Dr. Captain Kelly and I have been invited to some pre-Unity Day activities happening at Kent Island Elementary and Mattapique Elementary <coughs> on that Monday and Tuesday since she and I are both going to be in Ocean City for the MAVE convention. I just want to make sure, clear it with everyone if that's all right that we go. Um, sure. You know, I just, I'm just asking permission if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Sure, no problem. Um, since we're not going to be here, and, and we always enjoy Unity Day. So that's a that's a good question about the Mabe Convention of which board members will be attending. I know we are. And then those two are. I can't okay. do the child care. Okay. Well, that's easy <laughs> to remember. That. <laughs> that's easy to remember. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the Teacher of the Year Gala, which board members? I just wanted to confirm. I know Ms. Pauls is working on that. Kelly and Ms. Hopper. Again, I can't. We're okay. separate places to be in. Okay. Right. Captain Kelly and I are going. That's okay. a nice uh, event, though. I'm sure. The others can go. Okay. It was really nice mm -hmm. last year. Okay. After that, I just need a motion to um, adjourn open session. So moved. I have a motion to have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to adjourn open session. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Aye.